Hi, this is Larry Bauer, Chief Executive Officer of the Family Medicine Education Consortium, and I'm joined today by Ron Chichevich, who is a community health consultant and with a strong background working with not-for-profits. He is also a, uh, a writer who is going to help us tell a story about uh, family medicine and its impact on Hagerstown, Maryland, and Meredith Health in Hagerstown, Maryland. Hello, Ron. Hi, Larry. How are you today? Good, good. We're also going to be um, focusing on Dr. Doug Botts, a family physician who is a physician executive. He's also a husband, father, and a son. He is currently Vice President and Chief Health Officer at Meritus Health in Hagerstown, Maryland. He's also been past president of the Pennsylvania Academy of Family Physicians and the past president of the American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation. Doug, it's good to talk with you. Wonderful to join you both today. So let's start off with a little bit of background. Doug, can you tell us about yourself? Where did you grow up? How did you end up uh, on your path to uh, becoming a physician? Thanks, Larry. Yes, um, I grew up in uh, the mid-state in central Pennsylvania, um, in Mifflinburg, Pennsylvania, just a little west of Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, about an hour north of Harrisburg in the beautiful Susquehanna River Valley. Um, born and raised there and uh, had the great fortune for about 23 years of uh, going back there to practice uh, and to follow my family physician uh, in the practice of family medicine uh, uh, there, both uh, in an employed position and also in private practice for uh, a good portion of those years. I did my undergraduate schooling at uh, Juniata College, where I had a, a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Human Development, and then went on to the Pennsylvania um, State University College of Medicine in Hershey, uh, and I did my family medicine residency at what was then Harrisburg Hospital. Um, right uh, out of uh, during that residency time, I believe I was one of the first, uh, did celebrate the first um, FMEC uh, launch and meeting in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, it's just been wonderful to be um, in those circles for all of that time. I was very interested as a student at Penn State College of Medicine and family medicine from the get-go. Dr. Dennis Gingrich was my assigned advisor and has become a, a lifelong advisor, mentor, and, and very good friend. And many of us in family medicine, of course, know Dennis. Um, you know, my earliest recollection of wanting to be a physician, and, and then particularly family medicine, was I really was one of those kids who by about eighth grade, thought I wanted to pursue medicine. No one in my direct family was a physician. A, a beloved uncle of my grandfather, um, whom I never knew, was a surgeon in, in Philadelphia uh, and was well-loved by his patients and the family stories. He died a very, at a very young age in his early 50s, uh, so I never knew him. Um, so that was the closest in my family, but I uh, had a lot of educators and really loved learning, reading, um, you know, early on. Um, I had uh, great family ties, knowing all four of my great-grandmothers very well and uh, one uh, great-grandfather very well. As the, as the oldest of three boys in my family, I, I had that good fortune of uh, longevity and, and deep relationships. Uh, with family. I did a lot of volunteer work in the community uh, through uh, being very active in, in scouting, um, very active in 4-H, um, and uh, did a lot of volunteering at the hospital and in the area of nursing homes um, growing up. And had, I think finally I would say, a really deep love of both art and science. So my grandmother, who lived next door, who was a school teacher, also was a really um, was a piano and organ major as her first major in college, and so she gave me a tremendous love of music and the arts. And then I just really, really loved um, science, scientific um, exploration, um, 
the scientific method, questioning. And so all of that came together at a pretty early age for me in, in the love of both art and science. Uh, and that, to me, equaled medicine. And I think really the love of family and those deep family ties and relationships uh, ultimately led me very early in my med school career to thinking that I wanted to do family medicine specifically. Great. So I'm going to jump you forward now to you were uh, just beginning a new job at uh, Meredith's Health. And as I understand the story, you were brought in um, as um, a leader uh, in the organization, an organization that had never had much family medicine and certainly not a family medicine residency program. But why don't you start us with what was it like coming in, what were your expectations, and, and how did that, that all evolve? Sure. Well, I, I'm going to just uh, maybe back up from there a little bit to maybe talk about the launch and opportunity, if that's okay. Um, sure. I, I returned after residency and was recruited to go back and join my family physician um, also uh, in, in practice and thought I'd be practicing there for my entire career. I was quite happy. Um, I did, uh, you know, follow the footsteps of my family physician. He became a patient. Um, when I think of mentoring and the role of mentors, he also developed very early for me a love of family medicine in that when I would return home from breaks from school, he would always say, come on, let's go make rounds at the hospital. Um, you know, just very great relationship. However, you know, during my time there, I was asked to be a physician um, uh, representative uh, through, of course, the medical staff leadership positions, but then a physician representative to the hospital board and some other community organizations. And that sort of caused a, um, do you have a moment from the chief operating officer kind of, uh, uh, do you have a, a moment to talk with me? I liked what you said in that meeting, and I think it's important to hear the physician voice. And that moment turned into an hour conversation and ultimately led uh, in, in my former uh, place of employment, uh, becoming the first chief medical information officer, helping uh, to lead transition um, through uh, the, at the time, their new um, EHR system. It led to then becoming the chief health information officer, combining a report to the chief informatics officer and also to the CMO, the chief medical officer around quality and safety. And the reason I want to say that is because I think they were perfect places for a family physician. What really uh, drove my passion and early sort of exploration of physician executive work was what a family physician brings to the table when we approach transitions of care, excellence in patient service, and in quality and safety. And I, I've had the privilege over the span of my career to really see the transition of care training before EHR, revolutionary when I was um, a resident was a Palm Pilot uh, in the early advent with Dave Slauson and Alan Shaughnessy of, oh, yes. of info poems and evidence-based, you know, practice of care and all of that, and then all into the explosion of technology um, and, and what that could uh, do as a disruptor, what that could do to build possibility. So, that all is important background because um, I wasn't recruited to Meritus to start a family medicine program. I was recruited to be the first chief population health officer, now shortened to chief health officer, because Meritus felt that instead of just the traditional model of just one chief medical officer, that they wanted to expand physician leadership. And they particularly wanted to um, expand on population health. And that's important everywhere. But what lures the Pennsylvania in just two hours south and across the Maryland border, it was the opportunity of the uniqueness of the Maryland total cost of care structure in that there's global budgeting um, throughout all of the Maryland hospitals. And so you really, the value-based care transformation that we all hear so much more about um, happening really was happening on a, on a larger scale in Maryland. And I was at a point where I probably couldn't uh, go into any new position. I was feeling like 
I wanted a, a new challenge, and I was open to possibility. Um, it came up that uh, two really great partners were really ready to sort of take over the practice that I had been involved with, both in private practice and then an employed practice. And I decided along the way that I didn't really want to wait 40 years and not have sort of a transition plan for my patient. So we really planned for that transition. It created possibility. It brought me a little further south uh, to Maryland for the uniqueness of the structure. And two weeks into my new job, the CEO at the time, who is no longer here at the organization, said, we've had this concept for a while that is uh, that we want to have a family medicine residency program. And it sort of has taken off uh, with a grant on the osteopathic side, but it's never been led by a family physician. It was clear to me there wasn't a real understanding of graduate medical education. And it was happening right in the time that the ACGME was bringing all uh, you know, accreditation under one umbrella for both osteopathic and allopathic paths. Um, so I sort of landed here at a very unique time in my life and at a unique time in medicine. And my first surprise, it wasn't even a, the first 90 days uh, on the job. It was two weeks into the job. And the CEO, who has since uh, left the organization, was one of those people who uh, I think probably all along thought, here's a, a family physician. I really want a family physician. He doesn't know it yet, but I'm going to throw this his way. It has turned out uh, to be just the, the, the most incredible um, opportunity uh, that uh, for population health, for public health, through the current COVID uh, crisis, and for real change and innovation um, in this health system, and a real answer to the needs in this rural part of Western Maryland, Southern Pennsylvania, and uh, Eastern West Virginia, um, to really serve um, a community in need here. So here you are in this new job with now this new, two weeks later, this new uh, major undertaking, uh, which normally can take two to three years to uh, do all the background work, to recruit the, the faculty, particularly the new program director, to get all the uh, approvals from the national organizations that have to approve uh, a family medicine residency before you can advertise it. And here you are two weeks in and you're thinking, I'm assuming, okay, now how do we do this? So how did you do that? Well, <laughs> rule number one of leadership, surround yourself with uh, bright and uh, the brightest, the best uh, people that you can find. Um, appropriately guide them, coach them, but stay out of their way. So I had the great good fortune to uh, know from my Pennsylvania ties uh, that just up uh, the road a little bit uh, were two fantastic family physicians and colleagues who were also open to change. And, and the first was Paul Questenberry, um, Dr. Paul Questenberry, who interestingly was born and raised in Hagerstown and then practiced uh, in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania for most of his career, just about 25 miles uh, north of here. And, uh, you know, I knew Paul was really looking for an opportunity, and I, and I realized there was some risk because Paul hadn't been a program director before, but we didn't have anybody immediately interested uh, in the path with the timeline we had uh, to achieve that uh, at, the, at the time that had any uh, experience. And so I knew that there were resources. And again, that's where mentoring comes into play. And I've had the benefit uh, of really um, hanging on to some wonderful mentors that I could talk some scenarios through. So never underestimate the ability uh, of mentoring and networking. Larry, you know, very early on, uh, because of our relationship, uh, we, we were able to form, uh, you know, a, a very quick uh, tie with FMEC and the importance of the whole network uh, there, not just to me personally, but as the team shaped up to the team. And then I think you look around and you assess as a leader what skills you have, what you know, what you don't know, and how to sort of fill those deficits as you formulate this. So we are very fortunate at Meritus to have an incredible um, business integrity 
compliance regulatory unit and an, an incredible legal team. Uh, and I knew that those were really important um, folks to involve early on in the conversation of putting together the application and working through that. We also had a relationship established with the Mountain States Osteopathic Training Consortium, the MS Opti, and that's where some of the grant money had been secured. And they were very aware of the world changing, um, but we really wanted to underscore that we wanted this to be a place of osteopathic and allopathic medicine and to create the family physician of the 21st century that really uh, would answer the health needs of, of this region and of our country. And so having FMEC, having the Opti, having a good team here and a supportive senior team really helped uh, us to recruit Paul. Uh, and he was a fairly early yes. And, and once we could get Paul here and on the ground helping to bring together the rest of his team and pieces of the curriculum and some of the early application, we were we were able to create um, create that very very quickly, which helped us uh, you know with the accelerated timeline. We then had the very good fortune that right within Paul's practice, another family physician, our colleague Dr. Aaron George, uh, was also became available in a way that we we thought maybe would be a possibility down the road, but became available much sooner. And uh, so Aaron and Paul had worked together, and Aaron was born and raised in Chambersburg, but actually before he decided to go to medical school, taught a year here at St. Maria Goretti uh, Catholic uh, High School, private school in Hagerstown, Maryland. So to find two incredible family physicians at different points in their career, Paul, very similar to, to me, about 26, 27 years of practice, Aaron within his first four years of practice, both with ties to the area and the region, both of whom wanted to do the right thing for the region, was just a, an incredible program director, assistant program director uh, team out of the gate. Um, you know, as we continued to build, uh, Dr. Catherine Biggie uh, is, uh, was working not too far away uh, for um, WVU um, in teaching in a family medicine residency program and had a little bit of uh, role as a, a previous assistant program director. She wasn't looking for that position, but Catherine joined our team and brought um, strength um, to both inpatient um, family medicine and obstetrics and gynecology and family medicine and also to the osteopathic bench. And Catherine remains our champion of really making sure that, that uh, the osteopathic um, perspective and training is maintained to this day uh, in, in the residency program. Uh, and then Dr. Obafemi Okawobu, rolls right off the tongue quickly, was uh, not too far away at University of Maryland, and he was looking for a 0.5 uh, faculty, 0.5 practice situation, and we had a need uh, and, uh, in both the family medicine clinic that was already existing, but being brought into the residency clinic and merging those clinics together. So his skills of having uh, an MBA as well as an MD degree really helped bring um, the clinic together to guarantee that we had the patient numbers and ratios that we could stand up the residency as well as maintain access for many people who did not have an assigned family physician in the community and that we could continue to have that open access, but that we had the, um, the team, the, the patients to bring to the team right from the get-go, as, as we all know, a, a very important part of um, starting a residency. And so that really formed our core group, um, and they continue to attract, you know, people from the community, people from Meritus that are employed physicians to various degrees to want to precept, to want to help. There was some early reluctance on the docs who were practicing in the clinic. Well, we don't know if we want to teach, and we don't know if we can. Well, if you get around those four that I just named, you don't you very clearly find out that you can develop a love of teaching and a love of precepting uh, because 
the core faculty team that I just mentioned is a tremendous uh, group of individuals that creates positivity and possibility in every way, shape, or form. So I never could have dreamed of building a better team, and we continue to build on that today. Uh, but the, the number one leadership lesson in that is attract talented, bright, committed, passionate individuals, <laughs> guide them enough, but stay out of their way, and assess you know the deficits uh, of, that you need to support that team. So I'll, I'll pause there, but that was a big part of our success in a very condensed timeline. So you, you, you built your team and you started uh, recruiting residents. You took your, your first uh, class uh, of residents in July of 2019, is that correct? Uh, that's correct. So here you are, brand new program, you built a team, You've got brand new residents. You're literally creating uh, uh, your practice. You're creating your inpatient service. You're creating uh, uh, in the whole infrastructure and the culture. And then the COVID crisis hit. What was that like? I mean, that was definitely not on your planning board. <laughs> the COVID crisis is <laughs> is something that. Uh, I, I hope is a once in a lifetime disruptor like no other disruptor of of uh, managerial challenges uh, that I don't think any of us ever could have imagined. Uh, what I'm tremendously uh, proud of is that while visits to the office decreased, we were able to involve residents in surge planning for the hospital. Because of Catherine having full inpatient and OB privileges, um, and, and keeping in mind we had to be very early on in this crisis, like every other health system in the country, large and small, we had to preserve PPE. There wasn't enough of it. We had to be smart about what we were doing. So talk about an innovative moment. The residents were right in there, part of the surge planning. They rotated on with Catherine in two-week increments. We were able to successfully flatten the curve here in Hagerstown and Western Maryland and didn't out drip our capacity. But particularly for those first six to eight weeks, there was just a, a tremendous amount of um, concern of, you know, would we, would we be facing a, a, a peak that, you know, outstrip resources. They played a part. They strengthened internal medicine skills beyond what they had done with the hospitalists team here, and they had modeling of a family physician in full spectrum practice. I, I may, you know, add here that, you know, Catherine is quite unique in that um, she spends some rotation time, uh, and right before she started full time on the faculty, uh, up at the critical access um, hospital in Alaska with, um, with John Collin, uh, that, that uh, many of us uh, know as our uh, board chair and past president of the AAFP. Um, and so, uh, you know, in, in, uh, up in his critical access um, hospital in, in Valdez, she, she has spent rotations up there. So she is a tremendous leader and a uh, dedicated and committed family physician, full spectrum. So the, to have our residents, uh, no matter what they choose, be with her in, you know, calm times, but also in times of crisis, but with a very calm and guiding hand, um, they have all reflected that that was a really good uh, good experience for them. Um, we were concerned of how they would be dealing with this kind of disruption when many of us, uh, much further along in our careers, you know, were having con our own concerns about how to deal with this and checked in with them regularly to, to check in on, on their mental health, how they were feeling. I, I did not add that we have an inpatient psychiatry unit here, and so the long-serving director uh, psychiatrist Dr. Matt Wagner, upon announcing that he wanted to retire from inpatient psychiatric medicine, uh, got to be friends with this team and came on to the residency faculty at point five to be our uh, leader in behavioral health and um, and is leading our balance groups for the residents. So he's been not just for the health system but for the residents particularly a regular check-in voice of um, mindfulness 
and meditation and, and sort of leading with calm in the midst of anxious times. So our residents have benefited um, from Matt's presence, uh, Dr. Wagner's presence in this time. Um, we had this health system, had the senior team before COVID look around and say, who are the bright shining stars uh, that we'd like to sort of elevate and give roles to um, in the organization and develop. And so we have a general internal medicine doctor and then Dr. George, who were uh, chosen uh, to be a part of this group. And when we stood up uh, in the, by early March, the first week of March, our own incident command, we took that list compiled by the senior team and brought those individuals together to be in the incident command structure. So while Dr. George was doing his faculty duties, he was also doing duties in incident command and lending a primary care voice along uh, with his colleague in internal medicine. And residents rotated in and got to see what was going on in an incident command structure and how medicine was having a voice in there. So again, we multiplied overnight um, the uh, physician voice in helping to solve in real time all of the issues we were um, having to do here at Meritus. So those issues included standing up telehealth within two weeks. And we had that slated to sort of progress over about the next full year uh, because we were just about a year and a half into our, uh, our integrated EHR solution here. So we were sort of moving along on the timeline. Well, that got accelerated to standing that up in two weeks, not just for us, but for the entire community by giving them a rudimentary structure that they could do telehealth. Um, because our, our objective was to take good care of our patients, to calm their own anxieties, keep them out of the emergency room so the sickest of individuals with COVID would have the resources needed in the hospital walls. And so, you know, it really accelerated and amplified telehealth. It really um, accelerated and amplified the strategy of true value-based care and that uh, much more of the care uh, can be done by your family medicine team um, in, in whatever way we can reach patients in, in the walls and outside of the walls, and the residents were a part of that. So, um, you know, I will say that what was, you know, interesting just to back up a step even before COVID, uh, and that was, we got full accreditation in April of 2019, and we knew that if we didn't, we were going to be starting our first class in 2020. We knew that the need is so great to create more family physicians, and the possibility out, is out there that just through the, our networks that I talked about previously, we had 450 individuals contact us because we were out of cycle when we got accreditation in that April timeframe, 450 individuals contacted us to form our first class of six. So to start in July, we not only had to build the curriculum and form the relationships, we had to screen all of those applicants and invite a portion of those individuals to interview to pick our first six outside of the match in the SOAP process. So. And then along came COVID. <laughs> so I think it's important just to say, you know, the tremendous need and then what the tremendous response is by having a family medicine president uh, and to, to create our first uh, graduate medical education uh, opportunity here in the hospital. So your, your program uh, now was a resource, uh, an asset for the hospital healthcare system. What impact did your presence have uh, i know in the in the surrounding area there's a lot of uh, 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 primary care physicians family physicians general internists uh, what uh, and of course the the patients that you're all trying to serve what impact did the presence of the residency program um, have on that the larger group of constituents especially as uh, the covid uh, pandemic uh, evolved Sure. Well, pre-COVID, I will say that early on, uh, Meritus was blessed to have a Meritus Health Foundation. And the foundation is made up of some of our most generous uh, contributors in the community. And they recognize long before COVID the importance of improving quality and safety uh, and the care 
uh, you know, both in the walls and outside the walls. And so early on, they established a cornerstone giving club. It's a subset of the most committed donors to the foundation uh, award for the resident of the year. And so as all of our residents look at projects that they are doing over their three years with us, one resident is selected each year and given a significant financial prize to help with his or her project. And so our first resident, uh, Dr. Kezia Ellison was chosen for her project, particularly to teach nutrition to uh, teens and to uh, uh, young adults and to address some of the issues of food insecurity. So beyond Kezia's project, I would say we were getting involved and in partnering with many of the community organizations in a way that had not naturally happened before. And so they were community partners like the Department of Health, community partners like the Chamber, like, um, you know, the YMCA. There's a very active um, African Methodist Episcopal Church in town that does a lot of health promotion for the African-American and, and broader uh, community. And so all of the residents' projects involve something outside the walls of the community. We have another resident working on the opioid crisis and on addictive medicine, which is his particular passion. We have one resident involved in increasing activity and movement, um, and particularly with, again, our young, our young people. We know that uh, by them studying the population, and we had just completed our every three-year uh, community health assessment, um, we know that we are a more obese and more diabetic uh, county uh, in Maryland than the rest of Maryland, not the most, but one of the highest. Um, but yet Maryland is more obese and more diabetic than many other uh, states in the country. Uh, and, you know, learning that and getting to know that uh, one of the things we built into the curriculum in the orientation was sort of a sense of getting to know your community uh, and family medicine's role in it. So we already had the residents involved outside the walls pretty heavily, and that continued to the extent that they were able to gather um, in person or by Zoom or other, uh, you know, telehealth you know, modalities on those committees and with those organizations as a regular part of the check-in of how the community was doing. And I think we all know coming... Uh, managing COVID now until we have a vaccine, the aftermath in terms of uh, the social determinants of health and the uh, glaring exposure of health inequity in this country, uh, as well as the cracks in our public health infrastructure and what needs to be um, created coming out of this and what lessons can be learned and what are the silver linings and what can we improve on all of those very valuable lessons coming out of this, our residents have been intimately involved in. And I, and I think um, because they were so ingrained in the community before, they feel even more deeply ingrained now. So, Doug, if you can, I'm sure some of the uh, leaders of the health system, as well as people on the board, community leaders, um, perhaps have talked with you. But if we were to go to them and say, so what's the value of a family medicine residency program? Do you think it was a good idea that you all started one and had one present as this uh, pandemic hit? What, what do you think they would say? I think they would say uh, community partnering and collaboration, academic excellence, servant leadership, And what we hope to see, um, our first class is entering year two, and we welcome our second class on Monday. When we graduate that first class after their third year, a, a return is we, we hope to be able to attract many of those individuals to stay here. We hope we beat the statistic of 50% to stay in the region because it's a real recruiting strategy um, and that they are needed to tackle the tough problems in this community, just like family doctors tackle in any community where they are located. But that, that it's their bet for the region that we will raise the region through this residency. So 
do you think they would be saying it's a pretty good idea that they started a residency program when they did? Yeah, I, I think COVID magnified that. I think they would say, right. Thank goodness COVID happened because, uh, you know, thank goodness this happened, you know, before COVID because look, look what they did. And that just, that just sort of proves our point. I think we had a lot of foresight to support this. So, Ron, yes. you've been listening uh, to all of this. Questions mm -hmm. for Doug? Yeah, I have, a, I think, going another track here. Um, uh, because of uh, my work with FMEC and with Larry, uh, Doug, I've gotten to interview and to meet a number of family physicians. And as a non-physician myself, uh, what has become clear to me, and, and I guess I have kind of a two-part question or something to reflect on. Uh, one is that um, that there seems often to be this sense that family physicians uh, almost have to fight for the respect they get within the medical community. and um, uh, I don't need to be sold on how important you are uh, to me and my family, for example. But I wonder, um, you know, do you sometimes get the sense of it's like family physicians against the world, the medical world specifically? Uh, and then the second part of that uh, is that you had mentioned a phrase early on that said, prepare family physicians of the 21st century. And I was wondering uh, if you could define how that might be different from the family physicians of the 20th century. How has things changed for them in what you're teaching them and what their expectations ought to be? Yeah, wow, great question. So I think I think the fight for respect in family medicine, Larry, you can back me up, is unique to the United States. Every other developed country of the world places its primary value on primary care. Uh, mm -hmm. And we flip that, and that is not, uh, that is not something against my specialty colleagues. But we would have a lower cost, better outcomes, higher quality and safety uh, system in this country, and, and I hope this comes out of COVID, um, from a population health and a public health standpoint, if we strengthened our base of primary care. And that's why you hear so much from the National Academy about our increased workforce, increased residency slot. 25% uh, by 2030, it's the 25 by 2030 campaign. Um, mm -hmm. we, we just simply need to do it. And it, it rises above political party and the politics there. And, and in a time where we just seem to have leadership that is paralyzed on a national level and truth is being questioned and scientific method is being questioned and anybody can sort of say anything on social media, we need that calm, educated, guided, uh, relationship-building voice of a family physician more than ever before. I've never, I've never more strongly felt that and never have felt so passionate about that. I, I think I've done a good job over my career, and particularly in my leadership years, of becoming a better advocate and reaching out on state and national levels. Uh, I do it as much as I can and even more now, and I think we need to be advocates for that kind of change in our system. I think it's bubbling up uh, when, as we examine you know, some of the tougher issues facing our society like racism, the, health, the, the terrible health disparity and inequity that has been uh, even more glaringly exposed um, in the African-American and Latino communities with COVID. Uh, we've known about blood pressure, diabetes, and some of the inequities before, but it's just it's just laid it open. The the social determinants. Um, if you don't have a roof over your head, healthy food, you are lonely. Your risk of living a much uh, less year less in years life and less in quality of life is is far greater than mm -hmm. somebody that has that. And, and in a country as great of as ours, we can do better, and we need family physicians guiding that. So that, that, that's how I would answer that, that first question. I think it's changing. Mm -hmm. Change always happens more slowly than we'd like it. Um, I, I'll feel better about that change when every medical school in this country uh, doesn't try to say that we address primary care through internal medicine only, but that we have a department of family and community medicine in every single medical school in this country, and we expand funding to build more residencies in communities that need them. Uh, then, I'll, then I'll feel better mm -hmm. about that. But I'm, I'm passionate about it. 
and I think anybody uh, in leadership or in a, in a residency program in an academic setting is, but we need all voices passionate about it. The family physician of the 21st century is that individual, I think, who is nimble and flexible with technology, continually uh, learns um, and discovers that that is uh, joy, that there's lifelong learning, and that burnout becomes a thing of the past because the technology becomes one other part in your uh, proverbial black bag of, of years past, um, like any other tool in there, like a stethoscope, like mm -hmm. an ophthalmoscope, um, and becomes, it's not a stumbling block anymore, and it's not just about coding and billing and work RVUs, and that goes away because we really are um, focused on the patient and driving to meet the quality and safety needs becomes first and foremost. And all of that other stuff happens in the background. So having them have an understanding and awareness of that, but helping them to continue to advocate to drive that change. Look what we've done with telehealth during COVID where barriers came down overnight. And that allowed us to practice telehealth across state lines instead of these sort of antiquated fiefdoms state to state that didn't mm -hmm. allow that to happen. We could, we could direct people to primary care venues of care from the emergency room so that they weren't crowding the emergency room and we weren't breaking EMTALA. We, we have to have rules and compliance and regulatory issues that make sense so that everybody's treated fair, fairly. We have to have physicians of the 21st century understanding that so that other people that are not the physician voice can't come in and put artificial barriers up that don't make sense to us, that don't work with us in the hospitals, out of the hospitals, in EHR systems, and out of it. So we need to create savvy learners that can be advocates to make sure that those barriers don't come up in ways that stifle taking care of patients. Um, mm -hmm. They can be anything they want to be. So if they want to do full-spectrum family medicine, you know, I think, I think that's such an important um, part um, of their training. Um, and I recognize that they may not want to do that, but they have to understand that if they're not doing full spectrum, what they need to do and what voice they need and what role they need to play, what voice they need to have in the transitions of care, which got me passionate about physician leadership uh, uh, very early in my career. And I'm still passionate about it today because we're still, we still have stumbling blocks. So we have hospitalists taking care of people and we have sniffists taking care of skilled nursing home facility patients and, you know, this specialist and that specialist, well, we need to be sort of the, the coordinator, the ringleader of the team, bringing all those pieces together so that we don't have a patient that has three uh, disparate health uh, uh, med lists from three different admissions that don't make sense and that are inaccurate um, and miss part of the story. We, we really understand relationships and the story better. And we need to really be able in the 21st century to have the right amount of high tech and high touch that enables us um, to, to, really, uh, to really do the best we can for our patients and reach them mm -hmm. wherever we can uh, because they may not be able to reach us in the, in the same ways um, as we traditionally think. And that was just, again, illustrated uh, during COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, one one very quick follow up uh, as it fascinates me. I read somewhere during uh, the crisis with the um, increase in telehealth um, that post COVID, the thought is that it's still going to be at about the 75% usage level, uh, which I think generally is a good thing. But I just wondered from your vantage point, are there are there any words of caution in terms of it becoming, as you said, there's high tech, high touch. It could lean to the high tech too much, and we could lose some of the high touch. Yeah, I mean, I think health systems coming out of this. I mean, we have we have to acknowledge that health systems took a tremendous uh, hit and loss in in the in this last quarter, um, and hopefully we'll recover. But there are the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns of COVID and of other pandemics, uh, and whether there's a false surge, whether there's a closing down again if people don't open sensibly. Um, and so 
nobody can sustain the the losses forever uh, that were sustained um, because everybody had to to do cuts. And so I think that it's often the case where people will even say, well, we don't need physicians. We can have um, nurse practitioners and physician assistants uh, fill that role in primary care. Uh, my fear is somebody would say, well, we can have somebody doing telehealth in California taking care of the people in um, Hagerstown, Maryland. But you lose that embedded voice and that embedded perspective of the community, and that that's vital to family medicine and vital to primary care. Not to say that the, the telehealth services that have somebody off-site can't be helpful um, to get people connected in a meaningful way, but I think people still want um, relationships. I think how those relationships are um, are fostered, however, in times of a pandemic are such that, you know, it may be safer to keep somebody at home and to manage their symptoms at home. And as technology gets better, we still may be able to, beyond just looking with a video visit, we may be able to, you know, do some more um, transfer medical information with in-home devices that can be deployed by home health agencies and so forth. Really, that team-based care um, I think becomes more vital, and that can still be a very uh, significant part of the high touch as well as the high tech. I think that the family mm-hmm. physician, by the breadth and the depth of the training, the continued commitment to continued learning and continuous professional development and the maintenance of certification process, is uniquely positioned among all of those other groups I just named to really be sort of the captain of that ship and to really um, be the point person to help direct the teams. And then it doesn't all fall on their shoulders and, and it helps them also uh, rediscover or, or continue to possess a deep joy in, in the art and the science of medicine that I opened with. Mm-hmm. Right, thank you. So Doug, are there any points that uh, you want to stress or you want to make uh, at this point we're we're approaching the uh, the end of our interview here I want to make sure that we cover all the ground that you hope that uh, we cover Larry uh, you know that one of my favorite uh, books is the art of possibility and I there's so many things that jump out um, from that book to me as a physician as a leader um, you know, as a father, uh, j- just all of all of the roles uh, as you introduced me. And I will just say that family doctors create possibility. Uh, they approach uh, disease and health prevention with possibility. They approach communities with possibility, and they they create it and create innovation and solutions to all of the of the stumbling blocks that come uh, a, a patient's way. Uh, and th- that's, you know, everything we named um, from economic, food, housing barriers, but, but also the, the, the real distractor, uh, detractors and distractors, disruptors is the better word, uh, like COVID and pandemics. Um, and while we hope that this is the once in 100 year pandemic for our generation, the world is really a small place. And I think family physicians understand their communities, understand how we are tied into a much larger picture, and and they are the problem solvers and the solution finders that uh, are needed for the health of of all. Great, Doug. Thank you very much. Ron, any other questions? No, I thoroughly enjoyed this. It's fascinating, not just what you're doing on a practical level, but philosophically how you're integrating, you know, the needs of the community with the um, with the family uh, physician practices. Uh, I think you're doing great work. Thank you so much. It's, it's a great uh, joy, but it's nice to hear it reflected back from both of you. I feel very honored to have been asked to participate in this. Yeah. So I'm going to bring things to closure, and thank you, Ron. And thank you, Doug for the time we spent together, and um, hope everybody has a great day. Thanks. All right, thanks, Larry. Thanks, Doug.